and welcome to Virginia Medical Update. As we discussed in the previous session, the cholesterol and the issues that have to do with treatment or not treatment of cholesterol have been a major source of debate in the medical community for the past three decades. In general, as we discussed in the last session, the most important and the easiest to comprehend determinant of what the risk is in terms of cholesterol is not the total cholesterol, rather it is a ratio of the total cholesterol to HDL or the total cholesterol to the so-called good cholesterol. So if we have a person that has a total cholesterol of 200 and patient one has an HDL of 50 and patient number two has an HDL of uh, 20, correct? Patient number one will have a risk factor of total to 50, which basically is going to be 4. Patient number 2 is going to have a risk factor of total to 20, which is going to be 10. This person is at a very high risk of developing heart disease. This person is below average risk of heart disease, even though the total cholesterol in both cases is the same. But other ways to increase HDL includes weight loss and exercise. And exercise does, in a very modest way, but it does increase HDL and decrease the chance of heart disease. Moreover, if you have someone that has a history of smoking or is an active smoker and they quit smoking, then the HDL also will go up. So number one, exercise, and number two, quitting smoking. The third issue is the third possibility, the third way of increasing HDL is nicotinic acid or niacin, which has been used significantly in medicine. It turns out that in general, those elevated numbers through niacin do not translate to decreasing mortality and morbidity. So when you treat people with niacin and their HDL level begins to go up a little bit, that artificially enhanced HDL does not mean that there is a decreased risk in heart disease. That's the most important thing. So exercise and tobacco cessation are the two ways to increase HDL, and that's the ways we have right now. However, so far, as you know, in medicine, we've always treated to goal. So we have, for a long time, and this is a criticism of the um, establishment, really, in a sense, that we have always treated to goal. Like we say, for example, treat the goal of 100, or the goal of 130, or to the LDL goal of, for example, um, 70, you know? But it turns out that the treatment to go is not really the best way to go about this. And in the past few years, studies have been done. And the studies have been showing that it is not really a targeted goal that actually is beneficial. But what, are, what is actually beneficial is the use of statins in general. And statins are a class of medications that actually build um, a block in the, in the pathway of, of the cholesterol synthesis, and they decrease the amount of cholesterol that a body can naturally make. And these drugs have been modestly beneficial, and they have been useful. They do block the synthesis of cholesterol molecules in the liver, and that is a very beneficial thing. However, the most important thing here is that if you have a cholesterol level that is elevated, to treat with to a goal is actually not the right thing to do. And in the past few years, there has been a new knowledge that has um, debunked some of the old ways of thinking in, in cholesterol treatment. So we used to treat to goal. Like we would say, treat a diabetic, for example, to an HDL, to LDL of below 100. Correct? or to an LDL of 70. But this mode of treatment to go is actually now not thought to be the best way. The best way now is this. We begin to treat people that have fallen into four categories. And I always ask my medical students this question. What four types of people do we treat with statins? And the answer is there are four groups. Number one, people with LDLs of above 190. Number two, diabetics. 
Number three, people that have coronary artery disease or evidence of by, um, bypass in the past or um, evidence of, of disease in the arteries. So people that have had heart attacks, for example, people that have stents, that population. And then the fourth group, which is the most maybe controversial, is the people that have a 10-year risk equal to 7.5% or more of actually having a heart event in the next 10 years. So if your risk is thought to be, by some metrics, to be 7.5% in the next 10 years, then that population gets statins also. So I think the LDL issue is important. If the LDL is 190, the idea is that irrespective of HDL, you could treat that. The evidence there is modest, but it is, it is useful. Diabetics, I think I agree, that's a very useful population to treat. The people that we need to treat for secondary prevention, the third category of people that have had heart disease, stents, bypass, absolutely, that's a kind of no-brainer. The fourth group, um, there is some debate within the cardiological um, circles, and they do seem to suggest that that 7.5% over 10 years is actually a um, low number, meaning that we should let that go up to 10%. So if the risk is up to 10%, potentially that could be treated, but if it's only 7.5%, that's debatable. So there is a debate there within the um, community. However, the official um, position right now is that at 7.5% 10 year risk, we treat. This is important because you don't want to also be using these medications, these statins, too much. You know, they cause myalgia, muscle ache, they cause um, liver issues. They, um, some of the more generic forms are really painful to the body. I've had people that, kind of, that can't use their hands really well, back pain uh, from the medications. And so basically, in those people, you have to actually stop the medication to begin with. Something that I'll end with for this um, session that is very useful is also the use of Metamucil. Metamucil by itself, Metamucil is used for constipation, for kind of um, softening the bowel, that kind of stuff. Basically, the powder form drops the cholesterol by 15%. So if you have a patient, for example, that has a cholesterol of 300, if they go on um, two tablespoons of two tablespoons of Metamucil before meals, that actually drops cholesterol by 15%, which basically means for that person it will drop at 45 points and the number will drop to 255. You can see that this is a pretty significant drop using just Metamucil. Um, by itself, and it's a, because Metamucil is basically a fiber product, it's, it binds the cholesterol, and basically doesn't allow the bile to be reabsorbed, and it's a fantastic, easy, cheap, and harmless way of treating cholesterol for some patients. So in general, yes, we do treat cholesterol. Yes, it's important to treat cholesterol. Yes, the studies have shown that treatment of cholesterol is very beneficial. The current thinking is that we use high-dose statins or moderate-dose statins, statins, but in my experience, the the low dose statins and mild statins also work pretty well uh, in terms of reducing um, the overall burden of disease. However, the four, group of, four groups that we treat are people with um, high LDLs of 190 or above, diabetics, people with heart disease, and people that have a 7.5% risk of heart disease in the next 10 years. If you have any questions or concerns or want to run some ideas by us, we'll be happy to hear from you at Virginia Medical Updates. Please feel free to contact us either on social media or by email. Welcome to Virginia Medical Updates. My name is Alejandra Gonsalves and today's topic is diabetes. Today on the show we have Faraday Abbasi, Faraday received her bachelor's in nursing from Indiana Purdue University where she graduated with high distinction and then she went on to get her master's of nursing from George Mason University. As a nurse practitioner, Faraday has been able to blend medical and nursing therapeutics while maintaining a holistic perspective in, uh, to help maintain and treat chronic conditions including cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and hypertension. Faraday has been practicing at Virginia Family Medicine since 2008. Uh, Faraday, tell us, uh, what is a little bit of a background uh, for diabetes around the world? Sure, thank you for having me tonight. I'd be glad to talk about this subject. 
Um, in order to respond to your questions about the epidemics and some background of diabetes throughout the world, uh -huh. I'm referring to this um, uh, picture, uh, which are, uh, explains about some uh, statistics of diabetes throughout the world. Um, these statistics um, actually have, has been given by uh, International Diabetes Federation. Okay. Um, and uh, just looking at the numbers, in uh, the um, impact of diabetes worldwide. Um, in 2015, there have been 415 million people uh, that have had diabetes. Wow. And it's predicted that in 2040, there will be 642 million people that will be diagnosed or impacted by this disease. So it's only increasing. Um, can you give us a few uh, details specifically on the United States? Uh, sure. So. Um, just going to the smaller scale in the United States, um, according to American Diabetes Association, um, in 2010, uh, there has been, there have been uh, 26 million people okay. that have had di uh, diabetes. And um, this number increased to 29 million people in 2012. So from this number in 2012, um, there have been 20, uh, um, one million people that have been diagnosed with diabetes, and um, about uh, no, eight million people that have been um, impacted by this disease, but they have not been diagnosed officially with this disease. Okay. And um, there is also uh, 1.4 million people that each year um, are diagnosed with the disease. Um, in, this, in the same year, 2012, uh, there have been 86 million uh, people that have been diagnosed with prediabetes, the condition okay. prediabetes. Um, and um, also, some of the researchers uh, in, in the field of diabetes have predicted that by the year 2050, there will be 50% of the population in the United States wow. that will be diagnosed with diabetes or prediabetes. Um, with that many people in the country that have this, uh, what type of healthcare costs are associated with that? Yes, so the healthcare impact of this disease is huge. Um, just considering that in 2010, the seventh leading cause of death in the United States has mm -hmm. been diabetes. Okay. And in the same year, also, um, the, the diabetes has been the leading cause of blindness, amputations, um, the renal disease, okay. actually renal failure, um, and also hospitalizations, um, and um, you know, also the diabetes has been um, associated with a number of conditions, with a number of cancers. Um, arthritis, wow. a number of uh, basically disabilities, uh, cognitive impairment, um, and renal and uh, liver disease. Okay. Um, so uh, considering the, um, the, this uh, diabetes that is causing all of this disease, right. it has also has caused um, major healthcare expenditure. Right. Um, again, in 2012, um, it was estimated that about $245 billion, wow, uh, billion expense, exactly, wow. has been toward diabetes and treatment of complications of disease, disease that from which about $176 um, basically b um, billion dollar mm -hmm. has been spent uh, for the medical expenses of this disease, and about $69 billion has been spent for the loss of productivity because of this disease. So we can understand the huge impact of this disease right. um, on the healthcare expenditure. So tell us, Faraday, what exactly is type one diabetes? Um, the, considering this huge number of people that have, um, are affected uh, by this disease, um, type one diabetes, um, peop, about, um, the percentage of five to 10% of all of the people mm -hmm. that are affected by the disease and have this condition, um, or they have type one diabetes. Okay, so uh, it's not that big of a um, percentage compared to everyone else. Exactly, so it's the lower percentage. In type one diabetes, uh, the individuals have genetic predisposition, of course, to this disease. Um, and 
this, with having this genetic predisposition, um, probably exposure to some kind of environmental toxins or maybe some viral infection, okay. um, that causes the, um, the body um, respond um, and to, with this genetic predisposition, predisposition respond to this condition and causes the body actually create some antibodies, which is called like autoimmune disease. Okay. Uh, create some antibodies that attack the pancreas and that causes the death of the uh, beta cells in the pancreas. Um, so with the, with the type one diabetes, um, when the, uh, and which is called also juvenile diabetes, okay. because the individuals that are diagnosed with this type one diabetes, they are usually during the in, you know, infancy and childhood, okay. uh, they are diagnosed with the disease. And because of the complications of the disease, they refer to the doctors because of dehydration, uh, polyuria, which means frequent urination and fatigue and increased thirst. Um, so they refer to the doctors and they are diagnosed with this condition. So in general, it's an autoimmune disease. They lose their beta cells. So the body or the pancreas is not able to produce the insulin. So uh, that's why their blood sugar stays up high. And those are, these are the people that they need insulin for their treatments. Okay, so tell us a little bit about type two diabetes now. Yes, so type two diabetes, which is the majority of people that are diagnosed right. with diabetes this have this numbers. condition, type two diabetes. And um, this is the one, you know, one uh, really is a metabolic disorder um, and with a lot of um, different systems involved with this disease and um, the uh, kidney, uh, brain, the uh, gastrointestinal system, uh, muscles and adipose tissue. But the main uh, focus mm -hmm. and the main cause of actually type 2 diabetes in the, is the condition which is called insulin resistance. Okay. So, and there is a um, direct link and the major risk factor for this condition as insulin resistance is or being overweight or uh, obesity. In people that they have, um, of course, type two diabetes, mm -hmm. there is, of course, genetic predisposition also to the disease. But what happens is uh, the pancreas produces the insulin. And insulin, um, as a hormone, it works like a key. And there are receptors on target tissues in the body, in muscles, in liver, um, in the myocardium, heart tissue, and different parts of the body. So the insulin actually attaches to these receptors on the tissue and works like a key that opens, this key opens and works with these receptors that um, helps the cells in the body use the blood sugar as a source of energy. So when this condition with insulin resistance happens, there is actually some malfunctioning of these uh, locks okay. or receptors in the tissue and, and as a um, um, result, the insulin cannot function as a key because of the malfunction, mal malfunction of these receptors. And uh, while the blood sugar is very high in the, um, or sugar is very high in the blood, okay. but the cells that they need this sugar as a source of energy, they are deprived of this so source of energy. And okay. um, this is a condition that we can refer as um, starvation in the case of abundance, which is sugar is very high in the uh, blood, right. but the cells, they cannot use it as a source of energy. And um, the people, usually these people are very fatigued and tired because they because cannot the use the levels. sugar as a source of okay. exactly. So tell us quickly what's something that we could do uh, or a therapeutic option for that, for a type two diabetes. So um, as uh, we said, the main issue with type two diabetes insulin, insulin resistance and um, the being, you know, especially considering in the United States, uh, one of the risk, major risk factors are being overweight or obese. Right. And that increases the risk of um, this uh, insulin resistance condition with the insulin resistance. And um, in what this type two diabetes and considering all of these complications of diabetes and huge healthcare in, uh, impact, what this is a reversible condition. Okay. So in so order, exactly. So in order to reverse this condition, reverse this insulin resistance, there are lifestyle changes okay. that can be used as interventions in order to reverse this condition. Okay. Um, and these lifestyle um, um, changes include 
uh, keeping the weight, of course, when we say obesity and being overweight is a risk factor of right. having type 2 diabetes, uh, of course, losing weight and keeping the weight under control, um, it can really help with the controlling this condition. And of course, the major uh, corner sore of treatment of this disease is these lifestyle changes, which include weight loss, okay. includes proper diet and nutrition, and exercise. They're very important. So thank you again, Faraday, for being here with us to discuss this important topic on diabetes. And thank you for being a part of Virginia Medical Updates. My name is Alejandra Gonsalves, and today's program has been brought to you by Virginia Family Medicine. Virginia Family Medicine integrates alternative and functional medicine in their medical practice to complement their expertise in medical care. Their areas of focus are in weight management, preventative medicine, and holistic health. Hello. Today I want to introduce a book called Distracted Mind. As you know, the normal day-to-day -day function involves a lot of distractions. And one of the major concerns for parents and for educators, but also for all of us, in terms of performance and achieving peak performance is the amount of distractions and sustained focus on any particular topic. Imagine that you are working on a particular paper or on a project, you're reading something, and the Facebook updates keep coming up, emails keep popping up, you get paged, or you, get, uh, you have a beeper that um, goes off. And so basically, one's attention is always being distracted. Well, there is a science to distraction, and there's a science to attention. And our book, The Distracted Mind, does seem to explore this area. This is written by a neurologist, a neuroscientist, and by um, a psychologist, both of whom have collaborated. And this is a fantastic book, and I think one of the best books that has come out in this field for a long time. And one of the major issues in the current um, world in contemporary society is actually this issue of having sustained attention on a particular topic. Let's say, for example, that the, our ancestors, you know, in a jungle are waiting for a moment to go to the river and get some water. As they're doing this, they know that they are at risk of being hunted down by predators, the saber-toothed um, tiger, for example. And as they do this, they have to be very careful and listen and hunt and gather information that's out there. So they look and are careful listening for sounds, trying to decipher the sound of a tiger walking towards them gently. In that process, people have to be ready to absorb the information, correct? And as soon as you feel that, then, then you try to run away or escape or climb a tree or something. So the fact that we are wired or hardwired to actually receive information and process it to avoid danger is actually an evolutionary thing. And it's a benefit to us. On the other hand, the most important thing is that in the contemporary society, where we're not really hunters and gatherers and we're not foragers anymore, we don't, we don't forage for food, or we don't forage for anything else, this has been ingrained in us in hardwire. And so basically we do forage for information. And that is the main theory of this book, is that there is a particular science to this and there is an evolutionary reason why we, are ten, we tend to be distracted. But in the contemporary times, then this distractibility and inability to focus is a problem. Everyone knows about the issues of, for example, texting and driving. Well, it's very dangerous to text and drive, and you can't really do those two things at the same time. But even if you're in high school or college and you're writing a paper, and you're also on social media, you're on your Instagram feeds, or you're on your Twitter, or your Snapchat, that particular thing by itself those feeds are distracting. And 
that task switching is not really multitasking. It's task switching between one task to another task really degrades the quality of attention. Remember that we all have very, very limited working memories. And our capacity to hold information and play with them is really limited. And so when that kind of random access memory, that, that RAM, is basically preoccupied with something else, we basically lose the ability to focus and to bring attention to the task and to finish it in a meaningful way. So this book is really an interesting book, and it does uncover I think some really interesting um, gaps in the way we process technology, social media. It's good for parents, it's good for children, it's good for people that are studying, it's good for educators, it's good for physicians like myself who want to keep studying in a focused way or want to help patients that otherwise would be trying medications like, um, let's say for example, stimulants or Ritalin or Adderall in order to maintain focus. Well, this book does teach people a very easy, focused way to remain to, on task and remain goal-oriented, and therefore it's a very recommended reading for this um, group that are interested in finding out more about the distractibility and ways to sustain attention and the biological basis for it. to Virginia Medical Updates. Today we are going to work on our uh, core muscle. Like any exercise routine, we're gonna start off with a warm up. We're gonna start off with march in place for about two minutes to just raise our heartbeat, march in place. We're gonna pick up our knees. Slow down. We're gonna start our exercise with plank, which is a great core muscle. Um, we are going to get on our knees in the floor. And I need a mat right now, but it's okay if you don't have a mat. You just come to the push-up position like this. Your body should be a straight line from head to toe. Make sure your hip is not sagging and it's not arched like this. And you keep your glutes and your abs tight and lifted. And hold. You can also, if you have any shoulder problem, you can put your forearms. Make sure that your arms, your forearms should be under your shoulders. Keep breathing. There are so many different variations of planks, but today I'm just uh, showing you the basic one. So the next one is side plank. It's the same thing. You just get on your side. As I said, your forearm should be under your shoulder and you lift up your hip and like any other exercise you have to do it both sides thank you for watching virginia medical updates my name is farnas and until two weeks time be safe be active and see you next time.